Hello lovely kittens, in this video we're going to be looking at natural selection and genetic information. This is a fantastic topic but it's one you need to pay attention to. If you want to make sure you don't miss out on these tricks a little bit, you can get a free version guide over on my website which takes you through everything you need to know and links out to videos for stuff you don't understand. Making new copies of cells involves copying DNA over and over again. And if you try copying something down thousands, millions of times, eventually they'll become a mistake. And this mistake might just happen once and then get forgotten, or this mistake might be copied over and over and over again. And if it gets copied over and over again, we've got a mutation and we've got natural selection. All of these changes added together, these small changes, these big changes, this is our theory of natural selection of evolution of gradual change happening over time, this theory thought up by Charles Darwin, that means we are more suited to our environment. Darwin's theory is that life, all life that we know these days, has evolved over the past three billion years from the first life, the very, very simple unicellular organisms that were in that slushy puddle. And the way this evolution happens is via natural selection. So that random mutations in genes need some natural variation in a population. So that can be small things like different hair colour, different eye colour or big things like how tall people are. So for giraffes, being tall is quite an important thing because it means they have access to a larger range of food sources. And individuals with characteristics which make them better suited to the environment are more likely to survive and reproduce. Whether this is tall giraffes or finches with different say, beaks or moths that have gone black or have gone white. And the genes for these useful, these desirable characteristics will be passed on to the next generation. Evidence for evolution comes from fossils. Um, not everything leaves fossils because fossils come from the hard parts, the bones, the soft bits are just going to decay away, so won't leave fossils. And we can see um, evolution happening with bacteria because they multiply very quickly, 20 minutes in some circumstances. So we can see changes, um, adaptations for natural selection being passed on and happening very, very quickly. Fossils can show us changes that have happened. And how different animals are related. From these we can use or draw an evolutionary tree showing us how closely things are related to things on one branch are going to be very closely related and the point where they branch off that's where they became genetically distinct. When Darwin proposed his theory of evolution it was very controversial. There were lots of religious objections. This is because he was saying that the earth was billions of years old, whereas that's not what it says in the Bible. And he was saying that we've evolved from monkeys, that we've evolved from primordial soup, and that's not what it says in the Bible. An alternative theory at the time is that acquired characteristics. Uh, so, for example, if you dyed your hair blonde during your lifetime and you had a baby while your hair was blonde, your baby would have blonde hair. Wallace worked with Darwin, they published a paper together, and Wallace was very important when we were talking about speciation due to geography. Mendel worked with sweet peas and he discovered or was the precursor to discovering genes or units of information that um, trans inherited units of information. Wallace 
when a single species of animals gets geographically separated, and this could be because they were on different islands or there could be a mountain range that pops up in between them, then we can now end up with a situation where we have speciation, where one species leads to various different species. And this is called speciation. Darwin saw this when he was over in the Galapagos Islands. That finches, small little birds, um, all started off as one population, one species. But as they separated out onto the islands, as they got separated from each other, they became quite different. The main difference was in the uh, shape and length of their beaks as they became more adapted to the food sources on those different islands. So whether they had to dig down deep to get the food, or whether the food was on leaves, whether the food was hard to reach, whether the food was easy to reach. Bacteria divide very, very rapidly. Bacteria that is happy, has lots of food, has lots of space and nutrients, is going to divide roughly every 20 minutes. This allows singing mutation to spread through the population really quickly. This is going to allow antibiotic resistance to really easily develop and spread due to random mutations. But if those random mutations mean that the bacteria don't get killed by antibiotics, they're going to be selected for by natural selection. And bacteria easily pass from person to person, or from animal to person, or from animal to animal, which means antibiotic resistant bacteria is going to spread really easily. Penicillin has saved many millions of lives, probably yours at some point, definitely mine. Because before penicillin, before the widespread use of antibiotics, people died of very, very common things. Going into hospital to have a simple operation, most of the time was lethal before the widespread use of antibiotics. The smallest infection could kill you. MRSA is a bacteria that is resistant to most antibiotics. Now this happens on your skin, it's there on your skin all the time. If you go into hospital to have an operation, you'll get swabbed for it to find out if you have it. But if you do have it and then you get an infection with it, there are very few antibiotics that you can use to treat it. The development of new antibiotics is very slow. Partly because we've looked for a lot of these in a lot of places and partly because developing new drugs is very, very expensive. So companies are going to spend their time, spend their effort and their resources looking at drugs that are going to make them lots of money. Drugs that people have to take every day for heart disease or diabetes. Antibiotics you take once for maybe seven days and then you don't need them again. So they don't necessarily um, make pharmaceutical companies a lot of money but they will cost a lot of money to develop. Carl Linnaeus developed taxonomy, which is the study of grouping living things together. We can see on our evolutionary tree here that some things are very closely grouped together and to get to other things you actually have to go quite a long distance. He develops a naming system where we have each um, organism has a two-part Latin name and this will tell us how closely related they are. It's a bit like them having a first name and a second name, a genus and then a species. The genus will be the wide overarching type of thing and then the species will be exactly what thing it is. With each new development in biology, with each new development in genetics, we understand more and more about classifications. So our taxonomy and our evolutionary tree is evolving all the time. The three domain system divides everything in life into three groups, eukaryotes, bacteria and archaea. Eukaryotes are things that have nuclei. I think we can take a second to appreciate how adorably cute these little guys are before we start to talk about the serious issue of selective breeding. Selective breeding is breeding an animal for a particular characteristic. It happens with dogs, it happens with cows, with horses, with cats, with chickens, any animals that we keep and we're looking for a particular characteristic have probably undergone selective breeding. And the advantages of this are is that you get animals which have the desired characteristic. 
whether it's the very flat face of a pug or horses that run fast or cows that produce a lot of milk. It is important commercially that dairy farmers have cows that produce a lot of milk, that dog breeders have dogs that look cute. However, the disadvantages to this is if you have a healthy animal who doesn't display the desired characteristics. For dairy farmers, they are looking for cows that produce a lot of milk. These are obviously going to be female cows. So any male calves that are born, they are healthy animals, but they are not showing the desired characteristic, so they're killed. Um, dogs that don't show the desired characteristic can be put to sleep, even though they are perfectly healthy animals. Thousands of dogs, cats, each year are killed just because they are not cute enough or do not look like the industry standard. The desired characteristic can lead to long-term health problems for the animals. I've chosen the pug as the example here. Because of the large number of folds on their face, it squashes their little nose and it gives them long-term breathing problems. Dogs like Labradors um, are very susceptible to things like arthritis and dogs like Rhodesian Ridgebacks, their desired characteristic is a mutation so any dogs that are born without the Ridgeback can be put to sleep. And then lastly we have a lack of genetic diversity within the population. So when we're talking about breeding this can lead to a lot of inbreeding where um, brothers and sisters are bred to get the desired characteristic which is going to lead to um, recessive bad mutations coming out more often in the population. It also means they're going to be more susceptible to any diseases that are going to be around because they don't have the genetic immunity. We can genetically modify plant DNA, so we can take our DNA with our required characteristic, whether that is a drought resistance gene, so there are countries that don't get much rain and are very, very susceptible to drought, can survive that better so that our crops are going to grow better. Whether that's um, a gene which um, produces a vitamin. So there are countries that um, don't have a good food security, where food is shortage, where people are dying because they're not getting the right amount of vitamins. We can engineer the food, the rice that they're growing so that it produces more vitamins so it's healthier so that less people are going to die or whether it's just pesticide resistance, or the ability to resist being eaten by um, pests, being eaten by bugs, so that yields are higher. We can take that gene and put it into our original plant DNA, producing a genetically modified plant. We can add in the new gene to the plant DNA, we can produce seeds, and then the farmers can grow those seeds, and the plants will have this new desired characteristic. Some people don't like genetically modified um, plants because they think it's interfering with nature. Genetic engineering has brought around some fantastic advances. One of the most useful of this is the way we produce insulin these days. Previously, insulin used to be harvested from pig cells and that's what people had to inject. It wasn't very um, uh, good and it wasn't very efficient. These days, we've taken the gene for insulin, we've taken a bit of bacterial DNA, um, with the original DNA has our desired characteristic, and bacterial DNA reproduces really quickly. The insertion of the gene for insulin into the bacterial DNA means that the bacteria are now producing insulin. So we are now producing large amounts of human insulin, which is a really important point, quickly and safely. This is much, much better for people than having to inject pig insulin. It's made things much cheaper, much faster and much safer. There is a number of different ways that cloning can take place. We can do it with a plant where we just chop a little bit off. Pop that into something like rooting hormone, put it into the soil, put it into the new pots and it will grow into a new plant. This works really well with things like lavender or strawberries. We can do it by tissue culture, where we can let one cell divide. Then we can take that, put it into further petri dishes until we have lots of dishes of the same. 